So let's introduce our experts. First, I'd like you to meet Katie Tammany. Katie's official title is Chief Marketing Officer, but she really fills the role of Chief Storyteller and Transpotter at Monrovia. Katie has more than 25 years of expertise in lifestyle and leisure industries, and she's a longtime avid gardener with specific interests in the intersections of garden, art, health, and well being. Hello, Katie. Hello. I'd also like you to meet Georgia Clay. Georgia is the plant selections manager at Monrovia, which is really a way of just saying she is our go to plant expert. But in her role, she works with breeders and plant finders from around the world to bring new plants to market for Monrovia. Hi, Georgia. Hello. With that, let's get started. Katie, take it away. Okay. I love talking about color. I'm ready for it, ready for spring to begin. Uh, but first, let's do a little poll. As Kathleen said, what are your spring goals? So, uh, these, you know, kind of touch on some trends that we're following. One is I want to get more fragrance into my garden so I have a full sensory experience. Or maybe number two, I really want to start doing gardening tasks the right way so I can keep doing, um, you know, gardening for as long as possible and actually maybe get more fit as I'm gardening. Um, or I really want to add more plants that I can cook and entertain with to my garden this spring. So, um, so you're voting right now. I can see the, the stats coming in. Um, and maybe you have other goals as well, which we'd certainly love to hear about. But it's great to see if any of these are really resonating for you. Because we might be coming back with a, um, a surprise webinar, you know, in spring that touches on, on the most popular topics. Okay. I think just about, well, maybe 70, 75% of you have voted. And it looks like getting fragrance into the garden and learning how to do gardening tasks the right way are really resonating. Um, I know I've just been starting to plant a few things in my garden and I noticed I'm not moving the right way. So about two days later, I was really feeling it. So I know I have some, some skills I could build there, um, but it feels good to stretch and get out in the garden too. Okay, well, um, should we call it Kathleen? What do you think? Yeah, definitely. So neck and neck, 39 to 38% for yeah. um, fragrance and then learning how to move, which is yeah. just great topics. Very great exciting. Topics. Very exciting to, to hear about. Okay, let's plunge in now. Let's see. Let's um, moving the poll off of my screen. There we go. Okay, let's talk about color. So as you may have heard, the Pantone Color of the Year, they're really the, the color experts. They have decided that peach fuzz, which you can see here in that square, is the color of the year. It's warm, um, it's peaceful. And I think one of the other reasons why this color is so popular in the garden is that peach is a great connector, actually, because peach is made up of reds and yellows and oranges. So it can really bridge uh, those colors and, and, and kind of be a, a connector between, you know, more vibrant colors in the garden, kind of create a more soothing palette among the brights. It can also sort of enliven your greens and maybe your bronzes, your foliage in the garden. It pairs well with purple and white and, you know, pink. And so I'm not surprised. This is the key color. Um, and we have so many plants that, uh, that use it. Um, in all kinds of ways, you know, shrubs, perennials, annuals. But I wanna talk about some of the other palettes too, that um, not just peach, but some of the other uh, trends that we're seeing in color um, in case peach isn't your thing. Um, so first up, we have what we call the City Meadow Garden Palette. And this really kind of um, is inspired by the interest that people have in natives um, and pollinator plants, not just natives, but cultivars that are pollinator plants. And mixing 
this feeling of being in a meadow with the fact that we have smaller uh, garden spaces. That's why we're calling this the city meadow garden palette. Maybe you don't have an acre <laughs> to really let everything run wild. Maybe you have more of a, a typical um, suburban backyard or front yard. And what are some of the plants that you can blend together to get that really uh, soft kind of Monet-like feeling in your in your garden? So Georgia has a, a few great plants, or actually more than a few to share with you in this palette. And it's really about purples and whites and sort of soft greens. Yeah, there's so many choices for this palette. Um, so I've pared down to eight. We have first up Cobalt Millennium, which is a wonderful allium. Allium's fabulous for pollinators. You mentioned part of this theme is the pollinator garden. Um, so Allium's wonderful for that. Cobalt Millennium is the newest introduction. Um, we have for 2024, it has these beautiful rosy pink flowers, an extra long bloom time. And then what makes it really special is this lush, glaucous, almost blue foliage. So that is a really nice calming um, color to bring to the garden. And then next is a really wonderful salvia called Vibe Ignition White. This has that pure white flower and it's going to freely just reflower throughout the season. So you're always going to have this sort of lush blanket of white flowers. Hummingbirds love it. Other pollinators love it. Uh, spring through fall, a long bloom season here. And then a nice rounded compact habit about two foot tall by two foot wide. And then next is Agara. I love Gara. The flowers just sort of dance in the breeze. Uh, typically, Gara gets sent to the back of the garden because it gets giant and it flops over and it's just not all that nice. Uh, the Steffi series is truly different. It is quite compact. So it's only going to get about a foot and a half tall, maybe two feet. And the flowers stay right above the foliage with no need to stake it at all. It stays nice and upright. So you really get to enjoy the blooms on this. The series Steffi itself was also bred in Israel. And so it's super heat tolerant. So it blooms really well throughout the heat of the summer also. And then next is cat mint. It's picture perfect. Uh, all the cat puns with cat mint, of course. Um, <laughs> picture perfect blooms two weeks earlier than other varieties. So you're going to have a longer bloom period. Um, the flowers themselves are also larger and they have a bit more blue to the flower themselves. So really quite um, saturated and bright. And you can see sort of in that picture, the habit, it's quite small. So 12 inches tall is all. And catmint can sometimes get a little bit big um, in the garden as well. And then moving below, we have fireworks agapanthus. This is a beautiful bicolor flower here, a uh, blue and white. And the, the um, umbels themselves are about five inches across. So they're really quite large. And they bloom uh, for uh, us at our nurseries, June through August. That's what we see in the garden as well. Really nice plant. It's won multiple awards. So the Royal Horticultural Society um, gave this plant the Garden Merit Award. So it's a really beautiful plant in the garden also. Uh, adding grasses like Blonde Ambition is really a wonderful way to bring a lot of movement and texture. So I love Blonde Ambition. It has that blonde seed head. Uh, it looks like an eyebrow to me or a little caterpillar. <laughs> Um, they stay nice and straight all season. And then throughout the winter, they're also on there as well. Uh, so many, many, many months of color and, and texture. And if you're in a colder zone, it holds up well to snow. And then Jazz Little Blue Stem is another uh, wonderful grass. This brings in a lot of the purples and blues into um, the palette also. So to, as you get cooler in the fall, you get more purple tones. And then lastly is Blue Note, which is a blue-eyed grass. This actually looks like a grass, but it's actually in the iris family. And so it does die back to the ground each fall, quickly pops up again in the spring, and it has these beautiful little dainty blue flowers that cover it. It's really, really a lovely little uh, grass-like plant to add to this sort of garden. I love how uh, mix and match all of this is. You know, everything kind of goes together. You could choose to plant three of these or all of them. Or, And I'm thinking, what a lovely pathway border this would make, um, or really anywhere you want to refresh your garden with just a feeling of um, nature and, and you know, the hummingbirds coming and, and pollinators buzzing. So really soothing. 
But to switch gears from the soothing to the bold, I uh, want to talk about some red carpet drama. Um, if you, you know, seen the awards seasons, you know, we've seen fashion, a lot of red uh, coming into play in 2023, 2024, and that's coming into our homes and gardens. So I think red is a, a very, it's obviously a very powerful color. It's a, it's a color about passion and joy. Um, and there are so many easy ways to get a spot of red into the garden. You don't have to, you know, turn your whole garden over to the palette, let's say, but it it can create such a striking um, moment in the garden. And I think, you know, red is opposite green in the color wheel. So that's another reason why it plays so well in the garden. Uh, you know, peonies, echinacea, roses, certainly. Uh, we are seeing a lot of growth and, and development from breeders into the color red in all kinds of plants, which is exciting. And I think the other thing that red plays well with besides green is silver <clears throat> and bronze and you know those shades in, in foliage that have become more popular as well. Um, so I'm super excited about red. I was never a fan until recently. Now I'm now I'm really getting interested in popping some red into into my own garden. So we've got a lot of choices. Yeah, there are a lot of choices for red and I couldn't, again, I couldn't help myself but to pick eight. So um, here we go. The first up is American Pie Cherry Pie Dianthus. American Pie is the series and Cherry Pie is this particular red flower here. Um, this is a beautiful upright dianthus the you mentioned that red and silver and what i love about this is that it has silvery foliage and then the flower itself is this brilliant bright saturated red and quite large this is bred by wetman pinks and they are one of the leading dianthus breeders in the world they're renowned for their fragrance which Cherry pie does have a fragrance and they're cold and drought tolerant. So they're super hardy plants and that balance between the silver and red is really beautiful. And then next is an agastache. It's kudos red. If you're looking for a red flowering agastache, this is the best one on the market. It has the largest flowers. It has a really nice short, well-branched habit, which means it's not going to stay or it's not going to flop over in the garden. Um, and it just has a uh, excellent color and just ability to keep pumping out the blooms. It has wonderful rebloom, also loved by butterflies and hummingbirds. And then hookra, of course, if you're looking for red in the garden, hookra is a classic. Forever red we really love because the foliage remains consistent in color throughout the year. So, you know, sometimes you'll get a fade out in the summer when it gets really hot, the red will sort of dole down, but forever red really keeps that rich, saturated color. And then snowy owl was just an idea to pair some of this with that silver foliage. This is a beautiful plant uh, for contrasting. It has that big velvety silver foliage and it just breezes through the summer heat. So with all these summer flowering and spring flowering plants, this is gonna look good all year. And then down below are some, are some, well, there's a tropical here, Canova Bronze Scarlet Canna Lily. Uh, this is a beautiful, true red saturated canna uh, paired with this really dramatic deep bronze chocolate foliage. And so that's sort of, again, Katie, what you mentioned is a part of this with the silvers and the bronze. So really beautiful plant there. We also have Nitty Gritty Red Rose. Uh, Nitty Gritty is a wonderful series of ground cover type roses. They get about three foot tall by four to five feet wide. So they sort of sprawl out in the garden. And this red is a beautiful, deep, true red, and it repeat blooms throughout the season, both self-cleaning, so you not a lot of need to deadhead these, they just drop off the plant naturally themselves, and they have excellent disease resistance. Um, one of the other things I love about Nitty Gritty is that it's on its own root, and so if you're in that zone four area and you get a lot of stem dieback, what is going to come up from the ground in the spring is true to type, so you're always going to get that Nitty Gritty red. And then Photinia Red Dynamo is a new Photinia on the market. It's a really wonderful, uh, well-branched, tidy plant. They tolerate high heat and drought. So if you're looking for that sort of um, uh, uh, lands, if you have a landscape that's really 
hit hard with heat and drought and water stress, this is a great option for that, especially for those southern gardens. Um, and Photinia can often get leaf spot in the garden, and red dynamo has proven to be clean and more resistant to that than other varieties. And then lastly is Bountiful Baby. This is a wonderful new blueberry in the Bountiful collection. Uh, like the others in the collection, it uh, not only produces a lot of fruit, but it's also ornamentally beautiful when not in fruit. So you can see this is the fall and winter color is that intense burgundy red. It's absolutely gorgeous. And it's a super compact plant. So two to three feet tall and wide. Typically blueberries can get really large and really lanky, but this does not do that at all. Uh, and it gets loads of berries. Right now, if you were to go to our nursery or to the garden centers, you'd see Bountiful Baby just loaded with buds about to give us a wonderful crop of really delicious berries. Yeah, I was just at the California nursery and could not believe the number of blooms that was on um, this plant. But it's so unusual, so striking, that red foliage. And, you know, when I was thinking about getting red into the garden, I wasn't necessarily thinking about blueberries. So that's a really nice surprise. Um, so many good choices in red, too. If you want to just dabble in red and plant a container, I could really picture the Dianthus or the Agastache with that Dusty Miller in a container. Um, I have a red, uh, the red Sunvia, Mandavia in a container um, just at the entrance when you walk into my um, yard and it's just such a, a scene stealer, attention getter. <clears throat> so red, encouraging all of you to think about that this spring. Um, okay, but switching gears, maybe red is not your thing. You probably won't find it in the moody Mediterranean uh, palette. So we had a, an event at our California nursery uh, last week, and we asked designers to help us create some great new containers. And one of them coined this phrase, moody Mediterranean, uh, to describe when they blend um, rosemary with uh, maybe some lavender, really dark lavender, and mangave, which is a great, that's a, that's a crazy trio, but it really works. And I think what it um, is speaking to is kind of the Mediterranean style that's not necessarily evoking Italian or Southern France, but maybe more Greece or Tunisia, places maybe that are a little hotter, a little, you know, spicier, where you might mix succulents, really dramatic succulents, um, in with more traditional Mediterranean plants, like, you know, the olive and the rosemary. Um, but it, it's this is a great opportunity to use black mondo grass, for instance, in you know either a container or the landscape. You can see it in the container, <clears throat> in the middle uh, photo there. Uh, little ragu, uh, you know, a, a laurel of ours that you know is extremely popular. That would be great uh, in this garden. It's a lot about texture, obviously, um, but also structure. You know, I think you could have uh, cordylines, you know, in this uh, in this mix too. So not necessarily your traditional citrus, you know, parterre Mediterranean garden, but maybe mixing it up a little bit with some strong striking succulents. That's the idea. That's the idea here. Yeah, there's, uh, there's all these have just loads of so many options. It really is exciting to think about how you can pair plants together. But little ragu, you mentioned, Katie, perfect in this sort of palette. Uh, little ragu is wonderful because it's only eight foot tall by eight foot wide. So that's significantly smaller than some of the other bay laurels that you can get. The foliage is evergreen and it's held on a reddish stem. So it does have quite a lot of ornamental value. And it is the sweet bay that you use for cooking. So you can go ahead and snip that right off the bush and put it in your soups or whatever you want to use that for. So really wonderful plant, great for a container or in the ground. And then next is rosemary. I've chose chosen Tuscan blue here. I really love Tuscan blue because it's sort of upright. It gets about four to six feet uh, tall and wide, which is makes a really interesting hedge. I know around my neighborhood, I see a lot of uh, hedges with rosemary and I just think they're beautiful. Um, they're excellent for cooking as well. It has that deep green aromatic foliage and then that dark cobalt blue flower. And then next is a lavender. This is Anouk Purple Medley. Uh, Purple Medley is the newest Anouk lavender. It has larger and more flowers than standard Anouk. And you can see that dark flower color here, just making it a little bit more dramatic mm -hmm. than the typical Spanish lavender. Um, I really like the Anouk series because they do tend to hold up better, better to wet weather. 
um, mm. than other Spanish lavenders. I mean, don't put them in, in wet feet all winter long, but they tend to do better in a wetter climate. Um, I'm in Oregon, so I know that because my climate's a little bit wetter. Um, so highly resistant to foliar disease and just a great pollinator plant. And then black mondo grass you mentioned was in that container. I agree, it looks wonderful in this palette. Um, these will grow about eight to 12 inches tall. Perfect for, for contrast. And then in the early through midsummer, you get these beautiful light purple white flowers. And then it's followed by this purple black berry in the fall. So it just adds a little bit more interest, a little more contrast. Uh, cordyline, little red star. This is a new dwarf cordyline. So only going to get about two foot tall. Great for smaller gardens. Great for containers with that dark red bronzy foliage. And then next is a really interesting succulent. It's a mangave, which is a cross between manfrida and agave. Um, <clears throat> so it's a new hybrid here. Silver Fox has that awesome frosty silver gray colored uh, foliage, it's like symmetrical looking rosette. It's a really interesting habit with this Silver Fox. And it gets pretty big up to one foot tall by almost two foot wide. So a really stunning showcase plant here, um, thick arching leaves. And you can sort of see those little uh, almost teeth, but not quite so pokey. <laughs> Um, just a really nice texture that it brings to the garden. I also like that it has this like hint of purple in it, you know, so that when it, when you pair it with purple in the landscape, it's, it, that really brings it out. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah, like the purple uh, figs on the celestial fig. Um, figs are very classic Mediterranean, but I like the, the, per the figs here because it does bring that darker fruit um, into it. This is a beautiful purple bronze fruit that is on the celestial and it has this wonderful smooth shiny outer skin. It's also a smaller tree so only five to ten feet tall and wide which is perfect for a lot of gardeners who are working in smaller spaces and it's noted for its cold hardiness. It says zone seven but I will note that figs are often root hardy to um, zones five and six especially mm -hmm. if in a sheltered location so don't be afraid of fig if you're in a colder zone. Um, you can also overwinter in the garage if you have it in a container. And then another blueberry, of course, is Bountiful Blue. This is, uh, again, with that sort of bluish silvery sheen here that we've been playing with in this whole palette. Uh, Bountiful Blue has some of the bluest foliage that you can find on a blueberry. So beautiful foliage, again, a nice ornamental habit. This is about three foot tall by three foot wide, nice and well branched and just loaded with berries. These are self fertile, so you can produce fruit um, uh, with just the one, but obviously you'll get more fruit if you have two. And it, it's got a lower <clears throat> chill requirement, doesn't it? So it's, yeah. It does, yeah. So this is great for warmer zones. The chill is only about 150 to two hour uh, requirement. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's talk romance. And uh, now we're going bold with romance. So what does that mean? Uh, it really means brighter <clears throat> colors uh, in things like hydrangeas and uh, roses and, you know, your traditional romantic shrubs and, and um, perennials. And it also means uh, pairing them in some cases with unusual uh, things like the banana you can see here paired with the agapanthus for a really striking contrast, striking statement. Or it might be just loading up color in your border in a way that's really bold. So maybe mixing lots of different colors <clears throat> in a border, including mixing the colored lime in with um, with these bright pinks and yellows and oranges that kind of elevates it a little bit. So it's taking that that sort of Bridgerton effect we've talked about before um, and bringing it to life in a modern garden. And we've got quite a few um, plant selections that really are more bold with um, with these very sort of traditionally sweet, sweet plants. Yeah, uh, the first step is Ude Parfume Berry. This is a uh, wonderful shrub rose. It's going to be about four foot tall in the garden. Uh, what's special about this is the berry, the color is fantastic. It's almost purple. It's mm -hmm. um, it's hard to capture that color, but it's really, really quite a special um, color. And it also has wonderful fragrance, as you might guess by that Oude Parfume series name. It uh, really smells wonderful and it has a high petal count, good disease resistance as well. 
Oftentimes, the more fragrant the rose and the higher the petal count, the more disease prone roses have been, which is why um, you might have not seen too many new uh, fragrant rose introductions on the market. Uh, we've been working with breeders for years now to counteract that trend and to get those two uh, traits married together. We finally have done it, so we're able to offer these fragrant, high petal count roses with that same disease resistance that you'd expect from like a hardy, you know, grace and grit style rose. And then next is a hydrangea macrophylla, Seaside Serenade, uh, Fire Island. Fire Island is fabulous. You can see just that frilly pink and white flower is really unique and really quite bold. I also love this in the spring and fall before it's even flowered because the new growth is this beautiful maroon. And then in the fall, it also goes to a nice maroon red also. So quite dramatic in on all three seasons here. Um, and then dark green in late summer. This will bloom on both old and new wood. So if you make a boo-boo while pruning, um, you'll be able to get uh, flowers on, on new wood as well. Thick stems, so upright, tidy, no flopping. Thick foliage, so if you have a lot of wind, that foliage doesn't really tatter in the wind too bad. Um, and then the flowers themselves don't wilt as bad in, on those hot summer days because the flower is quite sturdy and leathery also. Um, and they last for up to three months on the plant, so the bloom power on this thing is just incredible. And then next to that is another seaside serenade, but it's Bar Harbor and it's an arborescence variety. Um, so these will bloom on new wood. They have that beautiful white, fluffy, ginormous flower, um, reliably very hardy all the way down to zone three. So if you're in a colder zone, Bar Harbor is gonna be excellent with stiffer stems, shorter inner nodes, so it won't fall apart, split open, flop over. It's gonna be upright and really quite beautiful all season long. Yeah, this one is just stunning. I know in the in the Northeast, um, it just gets rave reviews. It At its peak, it's just such a big billowy hydrangea. I just love it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and typically, you know, when you get those big billowy, they flop over right away. And yeah. So you don't get to enjoy it, but with these, you really do. Um, and then next is a uh, daylily. It's called See You Tomorrow. It's called See You Tomorrow because um, the flowers last and last and last. That is, each individual flower lasts up to five days on the plant. Um, the, the breeder of this plant told us that, and we thought, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, so we took a photo of the flower every single day at all of our trial locations across the country and they were right they um they really did last that long and ultimately it gives us about two to three weeks longer of bloom period total out of anything else that's available on the market so that's a huge gain for daylily um, it's already a really easy care plant and now it's going to give you an extended period of of bloom i also love that it's a yet yeah, bright yellow flower but it has this little hint of green to to it, which is sort of interesting. And then next is topiary. So we have beautiful topiaries like this wax leaf privet. I love this three ball poodle, but you can get it in a spiral or whatever other form you are interested in. Um, wax leaf privet in particular is a nice evergreen. It responds really well to pruning uh, and it does have fragrant white blooms in the spring also. And then another pop of lime for this is all gold Japanese forest grass. This is of course an all gold selection of, um, of, of Hakanakloa. It has that beautiful cascading habit for great for adding texture and that pop of bright color here. And what I love about the, um, the wax leaf privet, just to go back to that, the glossiness of the leaves that pairs really well with you know some of the really beautiful blooms that we're looking at here. The other thing about the bold romance trend is that, um, you know, a lot of the patio trees or other topiary that we grow would be perfect with this, like Laura Petalum, which is sometimes thought of as a, you know, a pretty sort of everyday um, plant in the garden shrub, but in a patio tree form, it really takes on this majestic kind of personality um, that fits that bold romance, especially, you know, when it's flowering. Um, Lantana in a patio tree form could even be part of this as well. Um, it's about getting that color sort of up too, you know, um, not just having it low on the ground, but drawing your eye up, which is, you know, why 
you know, maybe a climbing rose would be perfect, you know, in this, um, in this palette, you know, to just, you know, really sort of covering the scene in color is what you want to do, but using topiary, some of these other fun shapes to provide structure. Okay, so again, switching gears, maybe bold romance isn't your thing and you want sort of the calm feeling of being on vacation. Well, we've really seen a rise in interest in tropical plants um, of all kinds, people bringing um, traditional house plants outdoors occasionally, you know, during the summer for a limited time, um, being drawn to plants with increasingly wider, bigger leaves um, and all kinds of interesting patterns. But one of the uh, new things about this Trade Winds palette is mixing in white and purple into the palette. So maybe your traditional tropical colors have been yellow, orange blooming plants, uh, but I think white and purple bring kind of a soothing, breezy uh, effect to all that lush foliage. Um, so, you know, don't be afraid to mix in those colors as well. Yeah, so there's, uh, this is a fun palette also. I started it with Sun Villa White Mandavia, um, an abundance, a huge amount of crisp, clean white flowers on this vining plant. So it looks wonderful up a trellis where it can really, you can showcase all of those flowers just all season long. Um, or even if left to sort of spill out of a container is also really lovely. I also love that you do still get that hint of yellow that you think of in the tropical um, plants. You get that little yellow throat. So you don't, you know, you can, you can ease yourself into this palette with a little bit of yellow also. <laughs> And then next is a, a brand new colocasia. It's called Pharaoh's Mask. This is an crazy looking. <laughs> it's this really plant is insane. Yeah. 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 It's truly one of the most interesting colocasias I think we've seen. Um, just this super lush, glossy green foliage. And then what's really interesting about it is it has that purple, almost black 3D raised up veining throughout. So you get this really fantastic show, just this gorgeous um, three foot tall plant in the container or in the landscape. And then next to that is a plant called Regal Shields Alocasia. And alocasia is typically, I think we usually, at least where I live in most of the country, we think of them as indoor plants that are kind of small or on the smaller end, small to medium. Um, but Regal Shields is like the colocasia, it is huge. Uh, it's quite a stunning plant. Each of the leaf themselves is going to get about 20 inches long. Mm, wow. It's this big, lush, tropical foliage, perfect for a container near the pool or the patio. Uh, also an excellent house plant. So like an, it is an alocasia, so you can take it in uh, full time or you could do what I like to do, which is put them out during the summer and then bring them into over winter in the, in my house in the, um, in the winter time. But you can also get this sort of lush foliage, even with hardier things like a hosta. Hosta um, can give that tropical look, especially with the larger varieties like this olive Bailey Langdon. Uh, this is going to be about three foot tall by five foot wide. So it is quite large and lush and it gives you that same sort of feeling, but it's zoned for hardy. Uh, I also love this, the, the leaves themselves are more puckered, mm -hmm. um, multi-tone, blue, green, gold um, look to it. And then uh, next we've got a couple of purple selections that could be interesting here. The princess flower. Um, this is an evergreen shrub and you can see just how deep and saturated that purple flower is. It is quite beautiful. I also love the, the foliage on this. You can't see it in this photo, but it has this nice deep veining and it's kind of fuzzy in texture, which oh, yeah. gets... you just, you just want to pet it. Often <laughs> um, lush looking. Yeah. It's really quite beautiful. It's, it's, um, it, it, prunes well. So keeping it around six to eight feet tall and wide is really no problem. Ultimately, if left unpruned, it can be about 15 feet. So depending on what you're looking for, it can be, um, it can be a, a medium-sized shrub. 
And then lastly is Passion Flower. This one is Lavender Lady. I chose Lavender Lady because I love the blooms on this with those recurved petals. I think it's super cool. Um, this will bloom, you know, spring and fall in warm climates and then intermittently throughout the year and then late summer to early fall elsewhere. Um, it does produce an orange fruit, but this is a sterile selection. And so most of the fruit on Lavender Lady is hollow inside. Um, so for us, it's not uh, it's it's mainly for the ornamental flower, which is so stunning and fabulous, uh, and the butterflies really love it. Hmm. We do have some edible passion flowers. Um, I'm thinking um, purple possum is one that we sell that does produce a really nice fruit. You want to mix your edible garden in with the tropical trade winds? You you can have that too. Um, but again, a reminder that this palette. Uh, is sort of a lighter version of the tropics, I guess, with the white and purple uh, flowers in it. Um, okay, oops. Okay, next up, we've got, um, so maybe the tropics aren't your thing, go up to the mountains. We've got a lakeside cabin palette for you. And this is about warming up the shade. Uh, you know, last year, I don't know if you remember, but we talked about a trend where it was really all about luminous shade and really adding bright, bright lime spots in the shade to kind of um, enliven shady spots in the garden. But this is a little bit more soothing um, in terms of the palette. So you're mixing um, things like ferns and begonias and other shade loving plants with some warmer tones. Um, you know, maybe warmer toned ferns, but also hookera is a great, you know, option here, or maybe some things some kind of like an ivory creamy uh, color. Again, sort of creating a soothing palette, a soothing aesthetic. Um, I just love this mix of warm tones with the, the green, but it's still very foliage, uh, you know, focused, uh, and I think very, very soothing. Yeah, so this is a really nice um, palette here, this Jurassic Gold Wood Fern. This, you can just see that subtle autumn orange color to it. It has a really beautiful, rich orange in its new fronds in the spring. Um, it's almost this bright golden color. It's really quite nice. So really great for bringing that warmth to the shady spots. It's going to be about two foot tall by a foot and a half wide, so not too big either. Um, and then next to that is another plant, great for adding that orangey red. It's the orange New Zealand sedge. Super fine texture, super glossy, fine foliage. The leaves will emerge olive green, but as they age, they go to this really distinct orange red bronze color um, and with a really nice arching form for a lot of texture and movement. And then next is Hookra, Siren Song Orange Delight is one of my favorites for that orange. And it has that beautiful burnt amber shade with a pop of yellow from the flower itself. And then below that on the bottom left is Tectonic Magma. This is great for adding some really unexpected texture to the shade garden. Um, the foliage is this almost almost like dark gunmetal blue. It's this really cool color. And on the underside, you get this reddish bronze color. So you get a little bit of the warmth um, with this really interesting foliage. And they are zone hardy to eight, uh, which was surprising to me when we were trialing them at how hardy they were in the garden. Um, but they can be overwintered indoors as a temporary houseplant as well. And then Brenner, Brenner is just a classic perennial for the shade, so I had to include it. It's this beautiful splash of silver with that dark green uh, backdrop. It's just really quite nice. And you can sort of see that small blue flower in the spring. Mm -hmm. And then I added paper bark maple. I thought this was a, an interesting choice here because obviously um, it brings obvious warmth in the fall with its red color and of foliage, but it brings this year round really subtle warmth with that cinnamon bark that is just so ornamental and so pretty. It just looks like it's peeling away like paper and it just is this really beautiful, rich color uh, to it that I really love. Yeah, it's really uh, rustic, which goes with that lakeside cabin idea. I think the other interesting thing about this palette is that you can kind of see that peach, back to the Pantone color of the year, is subtly making its way into this palette um, with the, especially the top three plants, you know, that you, you have here. Um, and there are so many choices of begonia, too, if you want to mix in um, maybe some other 
texture, other, you know, variations on color uh, too. So really interesting way to think about shade, uh, warming it up and giving it this glow. So I also wanted to talk about containers a little bit and what's, you know, what we're seeing um, is trending uh, in containers and things that uh, are kind of exciting. So one is really thinking about a succulent container um, with that thriller filler spiller idea, which may be kind of unusual, unexpected in a, con in a succulent container, but thinking about how you might balance height and have something sort of drifting over the, the lip of a container. Um, and that could be, you know, indoors or out, which is you know, kind of exciting uh, too. Um, the other thing that we're seeing is what we call uh, structured statement containers, you know, where you've got one really striking plant, typically with a lot of the color show at the top um, in, in a container. So you're not, you're not combining plants, you're just choosing one sculptural plant. And we're seeing a lot of interest in a drought, you know, drought tolerant choices uh, for, the, for this kind of container. And then lastly, a trend that we've been seeing for a while is using grasses or grass-like plants in containers. And typically, again, just, you know, using one grass and letting it just kind of take off in a container. So all of these represent sort of um, easy, you know, hopefully low maintenance um, ways to enjoy a container, you know, in your garden or, a con you know, if you want to do your garden entirely of containers, these are pretty low maintenance ways to go. And um, I was just talking to Georgia about these last night and she came up with some good, um, some good plant recommendations that would see all of these. Yeah, all of these I think would be awesome on their own as statement plants mm -hmm. um, or together in a mix. So the first for that succulent container is the Surreal Vortex Symponium. And Symponium is an interesting uh, hybrid between Sempervivum and Aeonium. Uh, and so this is brand new breeding work. It's really exciting trying to get those two uh, genus to flower at the same time. It's just really fascinating. Um, so what that does, is it gives us instead of Aeonium is typically hardy to zone nine, Symponium is hardy to zone eight, which is great. Um, vortex, as you might guess by the name, has that really cool vortex growth pattern to it. It's really amazing as a full specimen and each head will get about 20 inches across. So a very, it's a spectacular uh, succulent for a container. And then next is Celebrations Fireworks, which is an anagazanthus or kangaroo paw, uh, drought resistant, super, super tough plant, uh, ink spot resistant. And the Celebrations Fireworks is an amazing flower color that you really don't see in this genus at all. It's that teal and green flower with a hot pink base and it's nice and compact so 18 inches tall or so is all so you could really it provides a lot of that architecture in a container it would be a great option and then one of my favorite new grasses that we have for this year is this live wire fiber optic grass or isolepis mm -hmm. uh, wonderful soft green leaves that sort of start upright and then as they mature they drape over the plant and they end in that small flower spike on the tip and so it really does look like a fiber optic cable it's really 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 cool and it's and it's done super well for us across the country in a container year round or not year round sorry throughout the summer mm -hmm. uh, really really uh, unique grass that would look beautiful yeah. on its own or in a, in a, in a mixed container. I'm definitely getting, <laughs> getting one of these this year and putting it in a container. And the, uh, the celebration series, um, there's also a really deep, in addition to the fireworks, there's a, uh, maybe it's called Mardi Gras, really deep sort of purpley blue. That's just stunning. So yeah. Mardi Gras is right. Yeah. Yeah, great choices. So, um, so I think that's those are the palettes we wanted to talk about today. But if you, um, you know, want to see more, uh, our new Shades of Beautiful is coming out. I think either later this week or next week. Um, Ten complete palettes, um, including some of the ideas that we talked about. Uh, here this morning, but others as well. Um, so if you're an email subscriber, you get access to that Shades of Beautiful guide anyway. Look look forward to that uh, to kick off your spring planting. And I think we have some time to take some questions. 
Um, yeah, absolutely. One of the questions we had, Georgia, I'll send it to you and not to stump anybody, but talk about the kangaroo paw in a container. Because I know um, I had one up here in Minnesota last year and it was absolutely stunning. So um, tell, tell us a little bit about why that's such a great container plant. Well, the reasons why I love it is that one, they're drought tolerant. So you don't have to worry in a container plants typically dry out a little faster. There's less soil volume. So that's nice to have a drought tolerant selection in there. I also love just the color of that kangaroo paw is just super, super interesting and unique. Um, so all the reasons why you loved it in your container, Kathleen, I think the celebration series just elevates that to a whole nother, um, a whole nother level. I also think because it's more compact, it's just suited well to being more, um, the star it's, it really holds itself well. And the amount of flower spikes that it puts up is pretty spectacular. Yeah, it's so architectural looking and it's just very modern, but I think it actually could go in any garden style. Um, it's, it's got a very spare kind of look to it. So I think in terms of the container, you know, we had it, we have it in a uh, kind of an old fashioned glazed, um, it's almost like an ivory container at our California nursery. It's just sitting on the, on the patio um, to give people an idea. So it's in an ivory container and, and the Mardi Gras kangaroo paw has that just really vivid sort of purple color. Gosh, it's just just gorgeous. Yeah, the colors are stunning on that. Just one of those plants that you have to see it in person to really yeah, see yeah. it for sure, for sure. Well, and a lot of anagazanthus just get crazy. I mean, I have one in my <laughs> my front yard here that's six feet tall. <laughs> so the, I love that this stays compact. I think that's one of the things that makes it great in the container. And that was kind of what I was getting at was, you know, wanting to make sure that this new breeding and the compactness of it makes some great container plants. Mm -hmm. We had so many great questions today and our experts behind the scenes did a great job of answering all of them. But Katie, we did have a lot that were really specific, um, you know, people asking about deer resistance and watering. Oh. Will this work in my zone and things like that? So can you tell us a little bit about my plant finder? Sure. I think um, one of the best ways to get answers to your specific questions about plants or finding a selection that meets your personal criteria is to go on my plant finder, which is on our website. Um, and uh, I'm going to just draw that up right now and do a little demo of where to find it. Yeah. Uh, okay. So let's see. So on monrovia.com, if you go to my plant finder and you enter your zip code, um, just do mine. Oh, that's great. You don't even have to know your zone. You just know. No, I just yeah, it'll it'll put it in for you. And I'm looking for a shrub, and maybe I want full sun. You put in you know all of your criteria. You know maybe you want I want low water. I'm in California. Landscape use, you have lots of choices. Uh, you, more filters, you can actually filter for deer resistant under problems and solutions. Uh, so um, sort of take this little quiz about what you're looking for. And then you hit search plants and it searches for you and it's gonna pop up um, choices for my zone. And it's gonna tell you whether or not it's available online or that you should check your local store. Um, and it reminds me of what my zone is. So that's my best tool when I'm looking for something. Um, that's where I go. Absolutely. We, we grow so many. I mean, we grow over 4,000 varieties. So um, I do have, you know, I'm becoming more and more familiar with many, but I really rely on the My Plant Finder um, database. So the other question that we got a lot, you just touched on um, with my plant finder. Um, if someone goes into an independent garden center and they don't see what they're looking for, what are their options? So the other um, solution we have for that is that you can special order um, a lot of our plants using Shop Monrovia. Um, so any plant that's marked buy online, you can click on it and choose your local garden center that participates in the Shop Monrovia program, and your plant will be delivered there. You'll pick it up at the garden center. It's only delivered when it when we think it's ready. So you know it's got to be a certain size, and you you could 
look at a plant or you know be browsing and, and thinking about your spring garden back in January and choose your plant to be delivered in April and then you know go pick it up and it's ready to plant in your garden. So um, especially you know garden centers have to um, supply plants that they know you know most people will like. But if you're looking for something that might be kind of unusual, you know it might be that the garden center really can't just buy one of those. So this is a great way for you to get uh, something unique and then get it at the garden center. You go to the garden center, you pick it up and you, while you're there, you can get your soil. You can get, you know, all your other, you know, needs, maybe see a couple other plants that might go with the one that you got. <laughs> so it's, it's actually, I think it's even better than purchasing a plant, you know, directly online, because when you go to pick it up, you do, you know, you can get help with your plant. You can, you know, pick up things that will um, help you fill it out. So help fill out, you know, your garden space or your container. So anyway, great tool that's become really popular in the last few years. For sure. I love the idea of going and getting really local information. That's the best way when you're gardening. So, well, those kind of wrap up the questions that we had today. So just a quick reminder to everybody that you'll be receiving um, a email with a link that you can refer back to the recording of today's discussion. It will also include information on all the plants we talked through today, and those will be linked. So you can click on it and go right to that plant page and get more information on all of the different things for those specific plants that you're interested in. So thank you so much for everything today. You two gave us so many great things to think about. My list got so much longer. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good news. That's great. That's what we want at the beginning of spring. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Bye, everyone. Bye.